Welcome back. I'm Steve Clemens, editor at Large of the Hill. Welcome back to the second session of our Big Future of Jobs Summit. I'd like to thank our sponsor, Nokia, for making this timely event possible. In our first session, we discussed the pandemic's ongoing impact on the workforce and lessons we've learned. Over the next hour, we're going to examine how the landscape of work is changing and what transitions are likely to become permanent. The role of technology is critical to any discussion of the future. In addition, we're going to zoom in on the increased importance of upskilling, pardon the pun, the value of investing in employees of all ages and a diverse array of solutions to bring back the workforce, jobs, and the economy. We're going to have an incredible lineup of speakers joining us shortly. But before we get underway, a few housekeeping notes. Tweet us at at events using the hashtag, hashtag TheHillJobs. We're broadcasting live and we'll take your questions throughout the program. And if you experience any trouble with the live stream, please refresh the page. I think that'll be a quick fix. Our first guest is a co-chair of the New Democrat Coalition's Future of Work Task Force and represents the 11th district of the great state of Michigan. Congresswoman Haley Stevenson, it's great to see you again. Um, you know, tell us about the, the task force and what are the highest um, you know, I guess the most important elements as you look forward, I mean, I kind of been joking through this day that we're not just talking about the future of jobs, we're talking about jobs of the future. And, you know, how do we, how do we med, med, you know, marry those? So, you know, I know you've worked on this not only in Congress, but in the Obama administration previously. So tell us what you think the most important thing uh, in your task force is. Well, and not only have I worked on this in government, Steve, but I've also worked on this in the private sector. And the reality is, and many know this, is that the jobs are here and that we've got advanced technology, advanced manufacturing jobs ready for people who have that expertise or that interest. And, and frankly, sometimes people don't even know that these are career pathways that might be available to, to them, particularly at a manufacturing shop for that maybe isn't a household name, but is producing uh, critical medical supplies or critical parts components for the automotive sector. And so really, this is a catalytic moment for us right now in the United States. And as part of why last month, alongside our majority whip, Jim Clyburn, we launched a working group on manufacturing to ensure that we are ushering in the best legislation focused on our manufacturing economy, focused on these jobs, as you call them, the jobs of the future that are here today, that are ripe for the taking, that are, uh, you know, the ones and zeros that are digitizing our entire manufacturing sector and industries of incredible scale and economies of scale that must be afforded equally and equitably to all Americans. And so that's a big part of what we're focusing on, just as we're looking to tackle the large challenge of climate change, and, and certainly the ushering in of electric vehicles that uh, are being uh, set as targets by, by our industry partners and also our, our federal government. Representative Stevens, that's a very provocative and important way to frame it. I, and nobody else has quite framed that way. The jobs are here. And we know they're here because we can measure them and we know what the gap is between, with, with unfilled uh, positions that are out there. You know, tonight, President Biden is going to be giving a speech to you and to many of your other colleagues in a, in a joint session of Congress. And they're going to talk about infrastructure. They're going to talk about transportation, mobility, lots of things coming down the pike and the millions of jobs that will be created. Is that the wrong focus? Should we be focused on instead of, OK, we're going to create new jobs, that it really is about the partnerships to get people trained and credentialed? you know, in a more nimble space to get the jobs that we already have, in addition to ones the Biden, as I always hear about job creation, I don't hear how you just framed it, that maybe we're, we're worrying about the wrong part of the equation. Well, look, we've certainly all lived through the future today, right? Uh, particularly in the last 15 years with the arrival of the gig economy and uh, the, the mobility economy that's also rapidly transformed. And so we, I think we all have these, you know, notions of, well, oh my gosh, if we usher in large scale automation and we have autonomous vehicles, are we going to lose all the truck driving jobs? And then all of a sudden everyone's talking about the truck driving jobs that we're going to lose. And they're not talking about the open truck driving jobs that we have available right now that need to get filled. Which and is so huge. It's a huge number. 
it's a huge number. And that's right. That's not even in light industrial. I mean, I'm every week going in and sitting down with manufacturers in my district and the small ones, and they all have job openings. And so what I want to see us do is, um, do a recruitment effort similar to what the army does, right? We want you and we want to incentivize you. And frankly, our country's national security depends on this. This workforce shortage that we have, coupled with the reality that the census data just showed us that we've got the lowest level of population growth since the 19th 30s, right? It, that this is a national security imperative that we need people working in these manufacturing jobs so we can produce these goods and not have these supply chain disruptions that we just lived through in 2020, but also so that we can have profit and growing and strong regional economies all over this country. You know, you were chief of staff of the U.S. Auto Rescue Task Force. And at that time, you know, the, the auto industry, in case people, you'd look at a car today or you look at an airplane, you look at anything that we manufacture. And there are lots of pieces of that manufactured all over the world. So you always have, you know, try to have trusted, you know, supply chains, both domestically and globally. You know, as we look at industry today, you know, you're sitting in Michigan and there's been a lot of discussion about reshoring, about bringing investment and manufacturing capacity back into America. Are we prepared for that? And are you worried at all that, that, that we're getting the framing wrong, that that, that, that is going to be, a, um, I don't know, an illusion? Sure. Well, what you're talking about is that supply chains are co com complex and that they're global. And that you don't sit down with any manufacturer who isn't an exporter or, by and large, who isn't an exporter or involved in international production of their product. What we want to identify and what we need to do, and you can look at the electric car batteries, a great example of an exercise that we've got to undertake as a federal government in partnership with private industry, which is we've got to look at the supply chain holistically. What are we making here? What are we not making here? For instance, electrolytes. It's a chemical that goes into the lithium ion battery. I've got one in Michigan that does this and another one in Tennessee. It's astonishing, right? And the chemicals all come from China. So it, when we identify and we mm. get access to the data and the information, then we can look at a, a suite of policy solutions, right? One has got to be diversification of existing manufacturers here in the United States. Second one, you talk about uh, reshoring. Yeah, there's, there's obviously some great opportunities with that. We saw this in Detroit 10 years ago when our real estate uh, prices were really low here, that companies, instead of moving overseas, were moving to Detroit. And I know a lot of them who did that. And it's it's a great thing. But, the, but the, we need to have an attraction strategy for foreign direct investment as well that can tie into diversification. And you'll see this, right, with some of these trade agreements that we've, you know, just recently um uh, participated in, obviously, the big one being USMCA. There is a plus up by American content requirement that also affords us a great opportunity mm. to do that diversification, to do that harnessing, and also, Steve, go to where they're innovating, right, and cooking out basic research and new technologies, sometimes originally bought by our federal government, but sometimes also sitting in the universities that can be commercialized. Not everything's a win, but you look at, you know, look at our Stanford guys who made Google, you know, 20 years ago. These are the types of things that are happening in a place I call home in Michigan, where I have laid off engineers, you know, 10 years ago who invented new products in their basements that are now small businesses right here in, in southeastern Michigan. Wow. Um, Haley, we've got to uh, go in a second, but there's a good question that's come in from Philip Iannuzzi I'd love to ask you. He's with the Workforce Development Leader for Learning and Development at Boeing. And he says, how can we use technology to respond to the compressed half-life of learning in the workplace? That is the need to learn, unlearn, and relearn new skills and competencies at a fast rate. I love this question. But I think with yes. regards to the task force, the New Democratic uh, uh, Coalition on uh, uh, Task Force on Jobs, that's, I think, a very important component of what you folks are struggling with. Yeah, and, I, and I'll tell you, Steve, I, I actually was working with Boeing in the private sector on this exact thing, which is, you know, the rapid transformations in digitizing our manufacturing base and the need to have engineers who understood those integrated systems, who got the time to get that on the job learning. Bigger companies like Boeing are really well positioned, and yet they're still asking that question. 
our smaller manufacturers, and this is right, their their clients are a lot of times the big the big OEs. They're they're struggling with just even the basics of Wi-Fi modernization, let alone taking their 30, 60 person workforce off the, the what they're working on on the line to get that additional job training. And so what we have found is um, on the job credentialing, which is successful, but also online learning through platforms mm-hmm. like Coursera, where I, I actually created the country's first online job training program in digital manufacturing in partnership with Lockheed Martin and the University at Buffalo. So part of this is meeting people where they are and also letting them know that you that you are going to be a lifelong learner as, as, as a working professional, that you don't just springboard out of a degree program and then you're set and good to go. It's, and we've also got to support the businesses so they've got the opportunity to do that on-the-job training. That is truly, Steve, the money question. This is something that our task force is going to take on in terms of backing up the small businesses of America so they have the resources and the support to do this. You know, I, I love talking to you and, you know, thinking about all the arenas um, that we can constructively disrupt education, credentialing, training, a lot of these areas and kind of, you know, get folks into these right positions that have the jobs that are here. Uh, Representative Haley Stevens, Democrat of Michigan, uh, co-chair of the New Democrats Coalition Task Force on Jobs. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mm-hmm.